empezamos. Sí, y media. Hola. Bu tarde. Good afternoon. Let us start the afternoon session. My name is Julio Gomez. And it's an honor for me to introduce you to the next guest, Francisco Martín, director of the festival La Mar de Musicas from Cartagena. I'd like to thank the organization for having invited me to be here at this event. And it's a real pleasure to introduce this festival and Francisco Martín, its director. For me, La Mar de Musicas is a festival <laughs> that I have been very much involved with uh, and I find it a reference in Spain for two reasons. First one, for the good taste. Taste is a very objective thing, it's open to interpretations. It generates a very interesting discussion. Nevertheless, there is a second uh, peculiar peculiarity that I always bring as a reference in the context of uh, festivals in Spain. And that is, um, the reference is for its commitment. I know Paco from, from over an hour ago, when we had the chance to have lunch together, and we were sharing a series of commitments and I very much agree to what he said. Because he said, a festival is something else. It's not just annual programming, it's a special event. I take La Mar de Musica as, as a reference in the commitment, not the commitment to a given style or to a given type of music, but with a type of artists. I'm speaking about the disinherited artists or the ostracized artists. It's like being in a no man's land, but even in their own land they seem to be unprotected. These are these rare artists, uh, rebel artists, I like to say. And my affiliation to La Mar de Musicas is because as a programmer, when the month of March, April comes, I'm hoping for some national or international agents to send me an email and uh, to say such and such is going to be in Spain. And from the name I know where it's going to be, and I know where he's not going to be. I'm referring to artists that we have shared, thanks to the international promoters, such as the case of uh, Omar Suleiman, Sang and Electra, just to mention a few names. These are what I called these ostracized or no man's land artists who require festivals like La Mar de Musicas not only to become better known, not only in Spain, but also for international tours. So thank you very much for your commitment to La Mar de Musicas. And uh, thank you for your work, for what you're doing, for the artists, for the music. Involved in culture for some 33 years. At the end of the 1970s, the beginning of the 80s, these uh, lectures uh, did not exist. So you're very fortunate to be here and to have uh, directors of such important festivals across Europe. In those days, we were more self-didactic or in a way we felt the cultural movement and how it affected our 
hometown and we would learn from mistakes. We learned for many years from mistakes. They have made us see things in a different uh, light. And that's the situation in which we started in the 1970s. This festival, La Mar de Musicas, next year is going to celebrate its 20th anniversary. 20 years seems like nothing. But I think it's a very important uh, figure. And out of the festivals here, I think it's the youngest one, because we have festivals here that have 60-something years of tradition. However, I think it's the only festival that has had the same um, festival, f the same director for many years. I think that many directors and managers have been in the other festivals, but in La Mar de Musicas we started with the management board, and most of us continue to work there. So it's important for us. It is held in Cartagena. Cartagena is a city in the southeast of Spain, on the Mediterranean coast, with approximately 220,000 inhabitants. And we think that the festival has a reason to be within the scene of festivals that take place in the month of July in Spain. So we have a festival with a very, very tight budget. I think it's one of the festivals with the lowest budget. And then I'll explain more details. In my presentation, I will address four parts. The first part, I think, is uh, very important. It's the parallelism that exists between the Festival La Mar Musicas and the changes in the urban scene in the city in the last 20 years. This has been something impressive. We'll see it in a while. Then I'll also speak about how the festival started, why it is held, some historic highlights. We'll speak about the media and new technology. It's so important in the festival. And of course, we'll speak about budgeting and sponsoring. Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. In 1995, when the festival started, Spain was in a deep crisis in the 1990s. The situation was rather unsustainable. These were the days when the, we had the refiner. We had um, several highly polluting industries around. It was a grey, ugly city. And we lived off the military because Cartagena was very much based on the Navy. I remember people with a certain age now, most of them, had uh, served their military service in Cartagena. So, from 1995, in this panorama, they set the grounds for this change of the city. First was uh, the Navy. They started to relinquish most of the important spaces in the city. In the 1990s, we had, uh, as you can see on the slide, the military hospital. It dated back to the 18th century. And all these military buildings, well, we negotiated with the Ministry of Defence to use these buildings as uh, university centres. In case you didn't know, there's a polytechnical university in Cartagena. So little by little, all the military buildings were refurbished 
to fit in these university institutions at nowadays, we have approximately 9,000 students in the university. So this is the military hospital. This is what it looks like today. As you can see, there's a great difference. It has been totally refurbished. It is right next to the port. Another of the changes, I'm, I'm giving these explanations to give you a background of the structure of the festival in these years. Another of the essential histories of this uh, transformation is the port. We used to be a city with a very important port, but the city was living with its back turned to the port. We only had 150 yards of seafront because to both sides, to, to one side we had the commercial port and it was uh, forbidden to access it and we could not enjoy it from the city. Here we had all the warehouses. And in less than 15 years, the port was uh, devolved to the city. It has been refurbished and little by little. We can see from the aerial view, all that used to be the commercial port is now uh, devolved to the city. All the citizens may go for a walk uh, by the seaside. And uh, I think this is what it's going to be. Here we have the new auditorium. It was opened a year and a half ago. And then we have uh, the only submarine archaeological museum in Spain. It belongs to the Ministry of, Cu of Culture. It's called Arqua. Above you can see the university, the old military hospital that we saw before, with all the um, university institutions. Another feature of this transformation was undoubtedly that of the Roman theatre. This was an important milestone that makes us uh, live nowadays for tourism. I forgot to say that uh, by this transformation now we have approximately 200 and something cruiser li uh, cruise liner ships that visit Cartagena which has uh, helped the local economy a lot. The Roman theatre was discovered out of chance there was a palace that belonged to the Countess of Peralta. It was demolished to build a center for regional handicrafts. And when the building was demolished, some archaeological remains were found underneath. And up until 1996, it was not discovered that it was a Roman theater with the capacity for 7,000 spectators. It was built around the beginning of the first millennium in the days of Augustus. This is the beginning of the excavation campaign. You can see more excavations. The final restoration and the museum that were commissioned to Rafael Moneo, the architect, and he did a very good job in a very positive uh, way. Here you can see the current state. This is one of the jewels that we have in the region with more than 700,000 visits per year. Last but not least, we have changes to the structure of the historic centre, the pedestrianisation of the centre, that was uh, an interesting solution for the citizens, for the shopkeepers and also for the festival. Because there is an interesting setting all across the centre of town. 
At first, a lot of people are against uh, the declaration of a pedestrian area, most of the shopkeepers, but after a few years they realize that this uh, translates into an improvement. And uh, then we have the architecture in the, at the turn of the 20th century, the, there was a, uh, an important mining industry in La Union, and so a lot of uh, Catalan architects were brought to Cartagena to build houses for the wealthy. And so in the historic center, there are many uh, Art Nouveau buildings. This is one of the main streets in Cartagena. And you can see how the situation has changed once that it has been declared a pedestrian precinct. Let's now talk about the festival. The festival started in 1995 the city council itself asked us that uh, during the summertime, well, most of the people leave Cartagena because there are, there are beaches close by and everyone in Cartagena had a second home on the beach. They would go down to the beach somewhere. And so most of the population left the city of Cartagena and the city council said, uh, why didn't we organize something to give life to the city in the summertime? Everything, all the odds were against us. In the 1990s, there was nothing to do in Cartagena. So we didn't know whether we were going to start a music festival or a dance festival or a theatre festival. We decided to go for a music festival. Essentially, we knew that there were jazz festivals in the north, such as San Sebastián. In those days, there were no rock festivals. We had Billy Cassim that started the same year as we did, and also Sona, they started on the same year that we did. So we decided, uh, given that we had a lot of miscegenation in the city, the city was uh, thousands of years old, so we decided to hold a Music of the World festival, although we didn't want that style to appear in the name of the festival. So we decided to think and we opted for uh, the name La Mar de Musicas, a sea of music, literally in English, would be the best way to uh, announce this festival without necessarily specifying what type of music or what style of music it was all about. And so the festival itself uh, would uh, eventually lead the people to understand what it was all about. In 1995, we had one stage. We had a half a dozen concerts programmed. From 1998 onwards, we saw that the audiences were increasing. We only had one uh, stage, which you'll be seeing in a while. And we decided that in the first three years, we'd had uh, special attention by the, by the media, it seemed, as if what we were doing was impossible. And to see ourselves in the media, in the major newspapers and television was a, a good hit. We'd already hosted uh, interesting artists such as Ali Farkature, one of the best singers in Mali, Rimiti, the Queen of Rai from Algeria, Moussa Darin, then this young guy called Carlinhos Brown who uh, had never been to Spain, his first time in Spain was in our festival, so we had names that were totally unknown at the time, and yet they were they were uh, made stars by the media. In nineteen ninety eight, it was a turning point we thought that it was time to change the festival. 
That's when we decided what it should be and what it is uh, today. We thought that every year we should invite a specific country, a country were to reflect for the fortnight or three weeks that it lasted, to reflect the music, the art, the cinema, the literature of such a country. Although in those uh, days we were programming some 50 to 60 bands, at least 15 belonged to the guest country. In 1998 we started with Cuba. In those days it was uh, difficult to speak of the music of Senegal. And then we followed with Brazil, Mali, India, Argentina, Turkey, South Africa, Mexico, France, Morocco, Colombia, Italy, new uh, African sounds, and last year, Peru. Out of these countries, we wanted the festival to have a specific uh, image with a special poster, so we commissioned posters from different friends that we had in those days. And here we have an example. This was uh, made by Mikel Barceló for the Mali special. This one is Cartagena's of the World, made by Guillermo Pérez Villalta. Then the photographer Chema Mados did the one for India, Oscar Mariné for Argentina, another photographer, Mr. Alex for Mexico, Jean Font Coberta for France, Ukalele for Colombia, and Mariscal for Italy. There are many more, of course. This is what we more or less, um, what more or less encouraged us to see how the audiences increased, uh, reaching up to 60,000 spectators that we did uh, achieve. And, and we couldn't have more because of the size of the venues. Now let's speak about the venues themselves, the stages, because they are important. They were very important to us. We had to adapt the music to each uh, stage, to each setting. It was very critical to have the right uh, stage or setting for each artist. Some bands were already famous, others were totally unknown. They were not mainstream, as is the fashion today. Uh, there were some important bands that had very uh, small audiences that we couldn't uh, fit them into a large venue. We had another idea, and that's all the venues that we had, we wanted them to be close to one another. To have, at the most, two or three hundred yards from one venue to another, so people could actually walk from one to another to watch the show. And also making sure that they did not overlap. One of the reference points of our mm, festival is that they don't overlap. The, the shows may start at 8 and end by 6 in the morning, but they don't overlap. Some of them are for free, others uh, you have to buy a ticket. The place we started with, one of the most magical places in Spain, I don't think there is one like it anywhere in Spain. It's the Auditorium Parque Torres. It is located on a hillside. I'll give you a picture of it in a minute. The Torres Park, there it is. It's in the heart of the city. It's in one of the seven hills of Cartagena. 
if you go all the way to the top, you can see the sea, but the, the band or the artists won't because uh, they're down at the bottom, but the uh, spectators can see the sea, they can see the Roman theatre and the whole city. It's in the heart of the old city of Cartagena. The stage houses 2,000 people, this venue, and usually the prize we have to access this venue is between 15 and 30 euros, depending on the artist or the band who's playing. This is where we add, or where we have artists whom we think they are going to be uh, requested by the, by the public, by the audiences. We had Jason Udur, Marisa Monte, Carlinhos Brown, Saris Keita, Fito Paez, Gilberto Gil, Philip Glass, Cindy Lauper, Buena Vista Social Club, Sinead O'Connor, Patti Smith. So these are bands that are well known and also for, for a minority audience. They do not have the capacity to have 20 or 30,000 people. So this is an adequate venue for 2,000 people where you can see Cindy Lauper, Patti Smith or Justin Dur, that you can almost touch them. This is the attractive side of this uh, venue. Within this venue in the year 96, we also had a symphonic orchestra of the region of Murcia. It was a nice orchestra. And we asked them to work together with us with a festival. And we wanted to have some special productions for this with this orchestra so that we could have uh, the, this uh, air of a premiere in Spain, something that could only be seen in this festival. We started working together with this orchestra and we had concerts uh, with people such as Carmen Linares, Omar Ortuondo, Milton Nascimento, with Armando Manzanero, Tumoreni de Abaco, Ludovico Naudi. Uh, this was very easy because the arrangements were done. The um, orchestra could rehearse. The artist came the day before and they had a wonderful concert. The second venue was the Arabian Castle. This is a balcony above the city, it's above uh, the uh, tourist park. Parque Torres is behind this place and here we see the castle. So with the same ticket to Torres Park you can go to this uh, venue for free and this is the dance floor. There are no chairs, people are standing up, we have bars and it's used on Friday and Saturday and it's from 2 to 6 in the morning. Oh, to, to, from 2 to 5, 5.30 in the morning. That's where we usually have all sorts of electronic music that has something to do with our musical style or our philosophy in the festival, such as, for example, Marcel Lehmann. We mentioned him before. Corner number one, Bombo Stereo. Macaco, when he was very young, 20 years back, nobody knew him. That was the first time he played. And this is a space uh, for young people, a uh, space for fun. You can have your beer and drink something and listen to this type of music. This is the Arabian castle with uh, the audience. Bomba Stereo, Nina Sigi, an Italian singer. The old cathedral is for me one of my favorite venues and the whole festival. It's placed on the side of the, on one of the sides of the Roman theater and legend has it that this was the first church on the first century in Spain devoted to St. James the Apostle. I don't think this is so. I think that this was built in the 13th century and it was later destroyed by bombings during the Civil War by Franco's troops and 
this is what it looks like. We have the Roman theatre just behind it. It's been okay. restored. And this is a perfect venue for me. We just have 300 people. And this is where we can express ourselves, we can bring the music nobody can bring to such a venue. And those are artists who don't have much of an audience, but they are key artists. And this is a wonderful venue, and I feel very fondly about this place. We have Shiban Gasparian from Armenia, the Kronos Quartet from the US, Anushka Sankar, Tumani Diabate, Julia Holter, Richard Galliano, and many artists who would not have the same kind of charm if they were playing somewhere else. This was a great venue for us. This is a great venue for us, and this, uh, it has some kind of magic. Here we see the cathedral during performance, Otomani, Julia Holter. And this is the arms patio. This is, of course, a military enclave. It was built uh, under the auspices of Charles III in the 18th century. And nowadays, half of this building is a museum, a military museum. It belongs to the Ministry of Defense. And the other half is where we have the municipal archive and the city archives. Inside it, we have this patio. There you have it. And within this patio, this courtyard, we built a stage and we have some 800 people for this. This is a venue for 800 people. It's great for audiences who want to see a concert of a band uh, that may have some potential but cannot reach uh, a level of 2,000 people. Here we've had Rocchia Traurea, Pink Martini, here we have Melody Gardot, the first time she was there. This is a very interesting anecdote. This was the first time she came to Spain, to Cartagena. And just by chance, uh, Spain won the World Cup. And she didn't know what to do because people were, the, the, the cars with their horns and there was so much noise outside. But she took it very gently and we asked her to come back where she could uh, have a concert and then she came back and two years later she came and uh, she re remembered her first performance in Spain. Here we have Marian Faithful. She's an artist who doesn't have the capacity to bring such a big audience, Lila Downs. And nowadays they may be very popular, but they were not so much at that time. We have a historic picture of Leon Gieco playing with Charlie Garcia, who has passed away, unfortunately. He died a couple of years ago. Then we have the square in front of the town hall. That's where we have free concerts every day. The square is a very significant square due to the facade we use as our venue. It's got space for more than a thousand people. This means every day the square is in the middle of a city and uh, the atmosphere around it is great. Every uh, evening after eight o'clock we have more than a thousand five hundred, a thousand eight hundred people moving around the city. And here's where we have novelties or people who want to be known. Eva Taylor, Las Migas, Fatima Tadawara, Antonia Fon, Kumbi All Star. Here you see the, the square, Town Hall Square. Here you see the, this, the place where we have the stage. We have the sea opposite and 
I think this other scat lie. So a thousand something people can be in the square for a performance. The drums of Burundi, Fatumata di Awara. El Batel Auditorium was built a year and a half ago. We wanted to use it now that we have this infrastructure. It was an investment of around 70 million euros. It was an amazing space. You saw it before when I showed you the harbour. There you have it. This auditorium was officially opened two years ago and we had to use it, that's for sure. Such an important space should be one of the venues of La Mar de Musicas, we didn't know how. So the first year we used the auditorium and for a festival, we were offered to have the premiere in Spain, uh, the time of Gypsies of Emir Costa Rica, and it had been a premiere in La Bastille Opera, and they called us and they told us that they could be available on those dates to have their premiere in Spain. Well, this was a very expensive production, but it was worth it. It was worth showing it and showcasing it in the, on the stage of this auditorium to have the official opening of this auditorium of El Batel. This is underneath the sea. This is 11, 14 meters below the sea. And the walls uh, are, they actually represent the sea. Due to the, uh, the actual heritage uh, laws, they couldn't have a higher building and they decided to build it underneath the sea. Here we have the opera of Emir Costa Rica. This is one of the scenes in this opera. And the following year we decided that as this had been a good experience and the space is of course uh, as much of uh, there's a formal space is enclosed. It doesn't have the same sense of freedom of Torres Park where you can drink, you can smoke, it's outdoors. It's a completely different uh, concept. But this space was used to grant some awards that we have started in the festival to artists whom we thought they had to be given some kind of recognition for their career or for some fundamental contribution that they've made throughout their lives. So we've had, we started with the Mar de Musicas Award and the first award went to Omu Sangaren because for us, she was one of the great African voices. We had discovered her in our festival in 1996 and then due to her uh, struggle uh, for women for African women, so we thought that this was a very way to a, a very good way to open this award series with this uh, person. Whenever we do that, we do a special production with the our D, and we try to involve her him in this award. They can choose other musicians they want to play with, that they want them to be on stage with them and to sing with them. In this case, Umu chose jazz saxophonist Jangar Bre and percussionist India, percussionist Trilo Gurtu, and we called them. We had some rehearsals and the show was utterly amazing. Apart from Musangare's band, then we, the award is also given by a special, a significant person, John Gombare. The second award was last year. It was given to Susanna Vaca. 
She's one of the great Peruvian artists of all times, and we give it to her also due to her task as a disseminator of Afro-Peruvian rhythm. And I think this is the backbone of Peruvian music. Here she is getting the award uh, from the Peruvian ambassador in Spain, a great intellectual. And this was the way in which we wanted to use the auditorium. We thought that this had to be something more formal. And from then on, then on any awards that are granted are uh, given in this auditorium. Our for last uh, venue is the promenade, the port promenade. We see it to the other side, you have the sea. This is the uh, sports harbor, the marina. And that's a day for a free concert and with great conditions so we, where we can see where we can have some 8,000 or 9,000 people just to enjoy the night for free from 8 in the evening till 4 in the morning. All con concerts in all venues are free. You need not pay any tickets. Here we have On the Tropica was Jules Peterson and La Pegatina. There you have them. And we have around 8,000 or 9,000 people. The Tokyo Ska Paradise Orchestra from Japan. Lots of rhythm. And then we have the Juan Beitita Square where we use the so-called venue, this is a small venue, that's where we have activities for children, and this is the venue we use for concerts, workshops, etc. Here you see the square. And here you have Alandra Vendas singing for children. They really enjoy it. We also have other activities, circus, All activities address children and we want children to be involved and we want them to be future spectators of La Mar de Musicas and we, in cultural centers we also have different workshops for them. Okay, parallel activities. Within parallel activities we have uh, an important budget for such activities. You know that whenever we invite a country, we organize some activities that are related to arts, literature, and cinema. The, the Mar de Letras, a sea of letters, uh, we have an agreement with the university. university. So out of each guest country, we select a few books by the writers whom we are going to invite in the summer. And we have a reading for three to four months of the books of these writers so that they themselves, during the uh, summer courses organized by the university, so that they can take part, so that the students can take part in such course, courses. So if they read Maria Vargas Llosa, they know that this summer they will be with him, they will be, have the chance to discuss with him, etc. This is a literary week, and it has to do with the guest country. We've had so many visits throughout the year, we've had many writers, Emil Esteves from Cuba, Santiago Rocalón from Peru, Roberto Belaño, Laura Restrepo, Chet Hamidukai, who is the letters, Maria Vargas Llosa, Michelle Welbeck, and a long list of writers who have something to do with the guest country. We have had poetry, prose, and we usually have four to five days of activities, and we have between 10 to 12 writers who are invited 
from this country. La Mar de Cine, a sea of cinema, is the same. This is a week. At the city center, we have a large screen, a theater with a large screen, and we can have films of all the countries we have invited. And we always select the last three years of uh, film production of this country, of the guest country. We've had um Usman Simben, the father of Senegal cinema. We have world premieres, such as, for example, Crossing the Bridge of Atiyakin, this Turkish-German director who has had many international awards. La Mar de Arte, a sea of art, is a key element as well for a festival. All venues in the city, both private and public, leave other spaces to us so that we can bring new emerging artists or already recognized artists. And for us, we've paid much attention to the work of uh, Mali photographer Malik Sidibe. We had a special session on Mali and he's now a renowned photographer. But at that time he was completely unknown. Just imagine when we came to when he came to the festival, he brought um, a suitcase with uh, the, its own pictures, and he sold them for twenty five, twenty, twenty five euros. And he so he brought a hundred and hundred and twenty pictures, and he was selling them in the auditorium in Torres Park. Because he said, I have to go back to Bamako, don't you want to buy any of these pictures? And many bought, I bought some of them, lots of people bought those pictures are around 8,000, 9,000 euros each nowadays. So whoever bought 10 is a millionaire now. So that was a very nice aftertaste of that visit. We had a Pierre Gonard a French photographer. We also had an exhibition, an important exhibition of a hundred years of photography in Cuba. We had Alberto Corda, a great photographer, who took the picture of El Che. It was shown in its original size because most of the time we just see the face of El Che, but we do not see the palm trees behind it behind him, and this was an important exhibition, Guillermo Cuitcoa from Argentina. And an interesting story was the residencies that we had. We had exchanges with Spanish artists and the countries, the guest countries, for example, we, used to, we told Oscar Marine, okay, we're going to work with Argentina. You want to go there and see what you can do and uh, have an exhibition here with whatever you have found in the country. And that's what we did for a couple of years. We did it with Oscar Marine or with the artist Javier Codesal or with artists of the land with Acamate Charles, Angel Larro who are artists who are very important in our own region. And finally, we had an exhibition I'm very fond of. This was a huge media attraction. We'll speak about this later. Sometimes you think that if you spend a lot of money, you think that you will have much media, you will get much media attention, and sometimes it's quite the opposite. You go into a very small production of 8,000, 9,000 euros, and suddenly the media wants to speak about it, they want to have it in all the news uh, reports, and critics come and are amazed because you're not sure why. This happened to one of the artists when, we, when France was the guest country, we met him in Paris and we asked him, he was called JR, he used to go in the night, at that time he used to take pictures and he used to paste them all around the city, illegally, 
and he wrapped anything, any official institution in his pictures. He was 22 years old. And we asked him, why don't you come to Cartagena? You see Cartagena? And maybe you get an idea, and we could pay the production of that if he could uh, have an intervention in our city. And so it happened. He was there for a week. We took him to the marginalized neighborhoods because we've seen very beautiful areas, but we also have uh, underprivileged sections in our city. He was very much impressed by it. And he said, OK, I'm clear about what I have to do. I need you to bring me elderly people who have many wrinkles on their faces because I think that this city is ancient, but at the same time it has a promising future. So I need to have a casting of um, granddads and grandmas. And in a couple of days we got 10 or 15 elderly people and he was taking pictures of them for a couple of days and he left. And when we had to set up the whole intervention in July, we had everything ready with cranes and people who were asking, who were there to implement this. And I'm going to show you a video because I think this shows with how much enthusiasm we did this. It was maybe 8,000 euros, 6,000 euros uh, in production, including everything. And this guy, JR, has even wrapped Tate Modern in London, Times Square, the favelas in Rio. So he has become a renowned uh, photographer. And if we wanted to bring him now, I'm sure we wouldn't have the money to do it. It would be impossible. We're going to show you the video. It's four minutes long with the music of Tomani de Bate, so that you get a good picture of what I've been discussing. surcos de la ciudad. Nuestras arrugas son los últimos testimonios de una ciudad que cambia más rápido de lo que envejecemos. De una ciudad de la cual somos las caras históricas, de la cual somos todavía la memoria viva. Cada una de mis arrugas y cada uno de mis días pasados aquí están inscritos en los edificios, en las calles y en los rostros de cada uno de los habitantes de esta vieja Cartagena que está hoy buscando su futuro y en la cual estoy buscando el presente. Cada 
una de mis arrugas y cada uno de mis días pasado aquí están inscritos en los edificios, en las calles y en los rostros de cada uno de los habitantes de esta vieja Cartagena que está hoy buscando su futuro en la cual estoy buscando el presente. Well, this is a project that we have somehow um, put together. It was rather inexpensive and it had a strong media impact because everybody suddenly wanted to come to visit the city after all these pictures of old people full of wrinkles. It was a very interesting experience. The media and new technology. As you know, the media for us is very important. Thanks to the media, we could say that we may have some economic impact. We have conducted a survey on, on the aftermath of the 2013 edition of the festival and the economic impact is very important for us. Although these are not uh, millions of millions, nevertheless, there is a company, Kantar Media, that has uh, made a survey of the economic impact of the festival. And the after all impact, maybe some 3 billion euros. which means that the festival is uh, very well positioned in the media. It's on the news, on TV, in newspapers, everywhere in the media. And so three or four years after the festival started, we realized that uh, all of this had to have uh, some visible person. So we hired a head of press department. It was a young guy at the time. He was 26 or 25 years old. Now he's in his mid-30s. He's still with us. He hasn't left to go elsewhere. And he's in charge of all the contact with the press. In the summertime he has support with a photographer, a video recorder and a couple of assistants too. But he is the one who shapes all the media contacts 
His name is Eugenio Gonzalez. In 1999, we started to adopt digital technologies. We opened a website for the festival. We thought it was a very important thing to do. And up to some four or five years ago, we had a community manager to update and refresh the site to put us into the social media, Facebook, Twitter, so there is someone in charge constantly sending news, uh, taking pictures, explaining what's going to happen in next year's edition, which is very important for us. So we have specialized uh, people working with us all the year round to cater for these issues. Budgets. We are very short of funding. We are impoverished, so to speak. The but also for the increase in VAT, which has been a hard blow for us. To raise the VAT by 13 percentual points is like a stab in the back that kills you literally. And the problem is that they don't, uh, they, they don't want to recap, recoup this, uh, go back. Why don't they take a step back and say, okay, we were wrong, let's uh, bring down the VAT. Unfortunately, the current uh, politicians are not going to do anything about that. I suppose Jesus has spoken about this. He's uh, also affected by this in the theatre festival. And this is a highly unsustainable situation. Bear in mind that most of the events in our festival are free of cost. All the exhibitions are free of cost. All the film sessions are free of cost. All the lectures are also free of cost. And 40% of the music is also with free admission. So when you have on the one hand budget cuts, and on the other increased VAT, we have a serious problem and we may even have to shut down the festival. In fact, three years ago we were already thinking about this, but uh, thank God there was uh, an important response from the citizenship, the citizens, and also the hotel and catering industry, the local press and radio. They all campaigned against the end of the festival and so we managed to save the festival with less budget but without uh, forsaking the quality. In 1995 we had six billion, six million, sorry about 36,000 euros. We had five days of program That five years ago, when we had the highest budget in the history of the festival, we had from the town council 1.3 million euros in private sponsorships, 216,000, and in revenues from ticket sales, ticket sales, 30, 320,000. So overall, about 2 million euros. The festival lasted for 20 days. More than 60 bands played and more than 150 other different events and activities took place. Right now the festival, after three years, the city council is only funding 500,000, less than half. In sponsorships, we have achieved 196,000 euros, and in uh, revenues, we have reached 198,000 euros. 
So the festival now lasts only 10 days with about 40 different bands and some 80 other activities. In the year 2014, the Lady Mayor of the City has ensured that for next year's edition we will be granted 700,000 euros. That's almost uh, 160,000 euros more than we had this year. As for the sponsors, we have lost a lot, especially from the beer uh, companies. Because of their marketing and merchandising structures, they are more into what they call the converse uh, converse characters, these uh, artists aged between 20 and 25 that go to festivals the last two or three days only with audiences between 50 to 100,000 this is what the breweries are now interested in this is the only kind of thing they sponsor now and our festival does no, not lie within that kind of a schedule so we were no longer receiving the sponsorship that we used to get from them because they use the money for other festivals such as the one that is held in Benikasim because after all it's what better suits their own business needs if you manage to get 50 or 100,000 people together, this means thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of beer that are sold. So the sponsorships may go up to three or four hundred thousand euros for other festivals that I've mentioned. These paid by a single brewery. Well, we have lost this type of uh, sponsorship, but we have gained others that also provide us with uh, some money. We have not achieved these sponsorships uh, uh, by ourselves. It has been done by the mayor of the city, who spoke to the heads of uh, large uh, oil companies or energy companies, and they make up for what the city of Cartagena cannot sponsor. 196,000 euros. Then the Ministry of Culture also cut its funding. We had a nominal subsidy of 100,000 euros, but now it's got down to 30,000. That has been a substantial cut. What we do have is uh, important sponsorship that we very much appreciate. This would be a payment in kind, so to speak. As you know, the festival needs a fleet of uh, vehicles, and this costs a lot of money. We need vans, we need uh, cars to chauffeur the artists. Some of them are very picky and also to move around the musicians. We need some 15 transfers that uh, ferry the uh, artists from the airports of Murcia and Alicante to the hotels, from the hotel to the performance venues. And all of this is sponsored by a brand of cars, a car manufacturer, the Opel. They provide us, uh, free of cost, the entire fleet of vehicles, almost 10 vans, 5 uh, expensive cars, deluxe Opel cars, another half dozen normal cars. So we end up by enjoying the use of uh, some 40 to 50 vehicles. This is, of course, very important for us. We also have sponsorship for many years now uh, from the most sold newspaper in the region. We have a cooperation with them. We organize the Night of Truth because the name of the journal of the newspaper is the Light of Truth. And they also give us free advertising that could otherwise be costing 
some 80 to 100,000 euros that we would have to pay out of our own pockets. We have a special section. We also hand out a booklet with all the programming for the festival, etc., etc. So these are things that we are using for some time now. And then there is also the collaboration of Radio 3. They're still very good uh, friends of ours. And so in their programs, they provide information about the festival, with the dates of when the artists are playing. The team of the Spanish National Television Company also comes to record live uh, shows in, on different stages for the whole of Spain. That doesn't cost us any money. We just have to pay for their expenses. Their hotel or the journalist comes and some per diem expenses for their breakfast, lunch and dinner. These are the most important sponsors that we have. As to the economic impact, of course we do have an economic impact to the city. If we have uh, right now some 40,000 people visiting, out of which only 30% are locals, the remainder 70% are from outside of town. So the hotels are fully booked, the restaurants are also full, the bars, the cafes are full. When we thought that we had to shut down the festival, they, there was an outcry. They said, well, this is something that is working, we're going to lose it. So this is an economic impact that we have not yet fully assessed, but this year I think we're going to hire a company that uh, will do a proper job of assessing the value. I know that there are other assessments made in other festivals that are not credible, but there is an impact out there. It does exist, and especially because uh, the agents speak to us about the increases that there are in this type of um, consumption. I think this is a challenge that we face for our festival. We endeavour to offer the maximum quality possible in order not to lose audiences, because for us the audience is the most important thing Without any doubt, if there were no audiences, there would be no festival. But of course, without uh, surrendering and always maintaining our philosophy to program with new musicians, with emerging artists, who would otherwise have no opportunity to be known here in Spain. And that's all. Uh, I'd like to now show you the last video in order that you have an idea of the Ambiance, uh, this video was recorded some time ago, it lasts uh, very little. So you may have an inkling of uh, what kind of people uh, goes, go to the festival. And with that uh, we have concluded.
Gracias. So, thank you very much. Espero que os haya servido de algo. I hope it's been useful. No, de, apuntar solo que además... <coughs> I'd like to just add that apart from the so-called musics of the world, the programming of the non-musics of the world, they must come from some country. It's Western music. The profile of uh, curatorship is excellent in every field. I'm certain that you have uh, interesting questions. I'm a bit deaf, so you have to speak up. Paco, I think that you should really make this a survey on the economic impact for the festival. I've uh, done this myself for Merida and to the Directorate General for Tourism of the Regional Government. I'm sorry I can't hear a thing. <laughs> Es que no oigo, ¿eh? No, no, no oyes nada. A que realices el impacto del estudio económico. Ah, sí, para el año que viene. Que te animo porque nosotros lo hemos hecho este año. Muy bien, ¿puedes oírme ahora? ¿Puedes oírme? Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Estoy muy feliz de que puedas oírme, Paco. I'm sorry I couldn't give you the data this morning, but we have uh, conducted the economic impact. And if we assess all the public from abroad, it's more than three and a half million euros. And due to this, the regional government has decided to increase the budget for next year by 400,000 euros. Because as soon as they have realized that this is an engine that uh, drives the economy for the city, this is a good incentive for the regional authorities who make decisions on budgeting. And it, uh, it's also important to assess the media impact. The media impact for the nine million euros. These are data that we have to provide the administrations with in order that they may realize that by cutting back on the funding to culture, they will uh, create lots of job losses. And I think that's the, the only way to make, them understand, to make them understand is to speak to them in the same terms. Well, I didn't speak of jobs, but apart from having six people working all year round in the festival organization, in the month of July, we employ over 200 people. As to the economic impact on the city itself, yes, we intend to conduct this survey, though we believe that uh, it will be very positive because some two years ago we were about to discontinue the festival, and yet we were fortunate enough to see that all those involved, the hotel industry, the citizens, the press, the radio, the television got together to prevent this. It was a call for attention and the mayor was very compliant. And I think that next year you're getting 400,000 more. I may get 140,000 more. Good afternoon. I have felt like a child in a candy store by watching this presentation because I think uh, that integration is all through culture and that we can really create an intercultural society. I'd like to know what the criteria are to select the guest country and how does the guest country incorporate? Is it involved financially? 
in order to know whether uh, one day you might be thinking of inviting my country, the Dominican Republic. There are countries that are not involved financially because they can't afford it. Or the case of Mali or Senegal. There are countries who could not afford it. But in such cases, it is true that they themselves Uh, achieved uh, funding from the European Union through funds that were provided for this type of events. In a way, relaunching U African culture in Europe. So they themselves applied for this funding from the EU in order to be able to attend, but not from their own governments. When we select the countries, when we select a guest country, I don't really know why we may have chosen Mexico or Turkey, I don't know. What I do know is that we never repeat the same continent from one year to the next. So if we have Mexico one year, the next year it has to be someone from, uh, somewhere from Africa or Asia. If the countries are involved, yes, they are very much. I'll explain to you. When we select a country, a guest country, I will tell you um, what happened last year with Peru. As you know, Peru is now in a very dire economic situation. And as it's an emerging economy, it is diverting a lot of money to promote its culture abroad. So when we decided to do Peru, we first contacted the embassy, that's how we always start. We got in touch with the Peruvian embassy in Spain. We explained to them what we wanted to do, what we need, and they sent us the foreign affairs ministers and the, ministry, the minister of culture, who are the ones who are going to provide the assistance because the embassies don't have, they don't manage funds. The embassies are just the mediators that communicate the importance of the festival and that for a month the guest country is going to be uh, known all over Spain. In this case there was a brand called Prom Peru. We got in touch with them. We went to Lima, we spoke to them and they supported the festival. If they hadn't supported it, it wouldn't have been possible. They spent almost 100,000 euros in airline tickets to bring the artists. If we bring 10 people at 1,800 euros the ticket, the actual airfare is more expensive than the artists' fees. So they sponsored all the airline tickets for all the artists that we had selected. So it's a very important sponsorship. This year, this is uh, breaking news, the negotiations are underway to devote the, the year to uh, Norway. We have been to Oslo. We have met several agents from the foreign ministry there and an institution that is called Music Norway, also with the Contemporary Museum of Oslo, to explain to them uh, whether they might be interested in being the guest country. I love their reply. They are very fast, not like the Peruvians. We would take two or three months in getting a reply from them. It's true, you would write them an email and you would not have a reply until two or three weeks later. These reply the e to the email immediately. So they have accepted the proposition that we have made, the choice of bands and musicians, and they intend to also support uh, us by paying for the airline ticket and also sending over some works of art. So this is the way for the countries to participate actively in the festival. So we can
start negotiations with the Dominican Republic if you want. Alguna más o nos vamos al café. Hola, quería saber si los artistas aprovechan para hacer red. Do the artists uh, network by playing in other cities and um, speak about the or do they have an exclusive uh, commitment to you? There are several formulas uh, for the contracts. When an artist is an emerging artist and wishes to be known, normally no one wants uh, the artist, if you know what I mean. It's true. So we program the artist, but no one else makes an offer. Oh, well, now that you're here, why didn't you come to this other festival? No way, no one wants to know. So in those cases, the lesser known artists that eventually became better known, no one wants them, because it's risky. And we bring them nevertheless. It's true also that there are artists that are the other way around, that everyone wants them, but we want them on exclusive terms, at least some of them. We have to mm, be different from other festivals, if you understand what I mean. So last year we had Synod O'Connor, the first time she was playing in with the band after many years and uh, releasing her new album. I said yes, but provided that was the only um, performance in Spain. But we don't have this exclusivity with all artists, ju just with a few of them, to differentiate our festival from others. Otherwise, we would, would all be doing the same. So if it's an unknown artist, we have no problem. Because no one else is going to want them anyway. <laughs> Who's going to want Ginny Gasparian? One of the best players of Duduk from Armenia, one of the best musicians in the history of music. No one wants to listen to Jivan Gasparian. Who wants to listen to that? No one. Good afternoon. I'd like to know, when you mentioned that the festival was about to close and uh, there was an outcry and all that, and everyone got together. So I understand that, it's, uh, that now you have a greater participation from the hotel and uh, catering industry than you had before the bad times have started. If you speak of participation, no. The hotel and catering industry never pay for anything. I don't know in your town, but definitely not in mine. They just want to make money. They want people, then they say you're good. And that uh, thanks to them, we're revamping the city and uh, commerce. It's the same as hotels. They will not help you in the, in the least. They don't even give you a free room for an artist. So all they want is for the festival to be there. But if the festival is not organized, then they get very angry. But thanks to them, thanks to the complaints, we managed to maintain the festival. But they do not uh, take part at all. Not even now. No, we have to negotiate with them the prices of the rooms. Because if we bring 500 artists along 10 days, Well, we, we are entitled to a discount. You're not going to charge the same as you would charge normally, no way. So we sit down and negotiate. If a room is worth 100 euros, well, uh, you can rent it out for only 50 or 60, and that's the kind of things that we do. So we have to struggle with them. But in this case, at least they did help to lobby in the media the chairperson of the Hotel Association also sent in letters of protest. We managed to continue the festival. Alguna pregunta más? Bueno, antes de marcharnos, permitirme que la haga. So before we leave, I'd like to ask a very quick question. How do you survive the politicians? And when I speak of politicians, I mean, those who rule and those who are in the opposition. 
it's very simple. For 33 years, I have been a cultural agitator. I agitate the culture of the city from the public field. I do it always from the public sphere. I've never had any problem with any politician. I've seen three different uh, legislatures come and go. I've worked with the Socialist Party, I've worked with a party that once uh, won the elections. It was a local party, the Cantonals. They ruined the city, by the way. And I don't know whether you know that the Popular Party has been ruling in Cartagena for 20 years. So this legislature, well, the mayor has been governing the city for 20 years. And she has been uh, a good promoter of the festival. She encouraged me to continue ahead and she also had those uh, budgets of the good days of almost two million euros. She had to cut them back because she had no alternative because there was no, there was no money in, in the city treasury but she also helped for the festival not to be discontinued. So my relationship with politicians has always been a very good one. Well, that's a good sign. That means that it's a project owned by the city. Well, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. And it's coffee time. Gracias.